All right. So hi, everybody. This is Brian with CICS Careers. I'm joined by Dale and Louise, um, and I'm excited to have a conversation today with Chris Bent. So I'll let him start by introducing himself. How's it going, Brian? Great to be here. My name is Chris Bent. I was a sports management and marketing major, graduated in 2012. And before UMass, I was an entrepreneur. I was mowing lawns and actually driving back during the weekends to my hometown of Acton, Massachusetts to uh, mow during the spring when uh, things were starting to bloom. Yeah. And I started a company actually to have a bit of a bigger impact senior year. That was a company called Crowd Solar that we were trying to crowdfund solar arrays for nonprofit organizations. Nice. And we went through the UMass Innovation Challenge, actually won $10,000 which was super huge. And that helped to kickstart that entrepreneurial endeavor. And I've been working at startups and other uh, others companies ever since. So, so that's one little, little lesson of entrepreneurship is how what you end up doing might not be what you start off doing. And one of the keys is just to get started in the first place, because once you get in there, you're in the game, you're talking to people, you're mm -hmm. learning, that is going to help flesh out your idea and your business so much more than any amount of planning and writing and thinking will actually do. Yeah, that makes sense. And there's that famous concept of pivoting, right? So I'd love to hear, I think you've been at doing pickles now for what, five years or so. So what were some of the, the major turning points for you in that journey or, or some of the, the highlights? Yeah, I mean, there's there's been tons of highlights for sure. Uh, and to give you a little bit of a visual, because Pickles is a tool for visual communication, I'll jump in and share my screen real quick. And basically, you can see this Mona Lisa right here. So Pickles originally started out as a collaborative coloring book where I don't have any artistic skill, but I was in a job that I felt that need to be creative because mm -hmm. um, I was just working at a startup, but I was just in the sales department, having to call a hundred people a day, book 10 meetings, deliver 10 demos. It was just all metrics. Mm -hmm. And what I love about entrepreneurship is the creativity that comes with it. And so I, I was yearning for this creative expression, but I didn't go to art school. I felt that like being an artist was really how you are creative. And so I had the idea as someone who isn't artistic to create a platform that just made creativity more accessible. So that's how it started out as a collaborative coloring book. I suck at drawing. So you just give me one tiny little piece to color in and I can do that in a minute with a hundred other people who also suck at drawing. And mm -hmm. together we can do this in an anonymous way that doesn't put anyone on the spot and results in some interesting end outputs at the end of this little minute creative session. So that's yeah. how it originally began. But then it was like, all right, what's this business model going to be? Who am I going to sell this to? How am I going to monetize this? And we were also playing around with different ways of using the technology, like asking questions, not giving a background image and letting people draw their responses. And that is actually what Pickles kind of evolved into and what we're using it for now as a uh, tool for visual communication with some of the first events that we did being these in-person events where people could walk by this uh, projector on the side of a building in downtown Montreal, use their cell phone or wow. tablet that we had on this bicycle and start drawing, in this case, what was the best part of your day and have those drawings show up way, way bigger on the side of the wall. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, we've been obviously had to pivot though because in-person events stopped existing at the beginning of last year. So we yeah. luckily were set to go digital pretty easily. And so we've really been uh, using Pickles as an icebreaker, as a networking tool, as a way of making virtual meetings and events more engaging. And that's kind of the, the pivot that we've been on. But in that time, I've also come back to UMass 
almost every semester as part of the marketing 301 class and doing different case studies where the students have actually helped us to determine which target markets, which value proposition, how we really get a go-to-market strategy to enter into these different categories. Because before this, we were actually going after children's hospitals as, uh, as that main target market. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So I, so it seems like you take mentoring pretty seriously coming back to the courses and helping guide students in their own direction. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, how you found mentors in your process and, and what they um, taught you and, and maybe what you learned from them. Yeah. So I think mentors are invaluable, truly. Uh, like one, uh, just at UMass, I mean, in addition to Brian, we, we stay in touch. Uh, Professor Matthew Glennon, he is the teacher at, of the Marketing 301 Master Marketing class. And ever since having his class in 2011, we have stayed in touch just because he had a unique blend of not just being in academia, but having a foot in the business world as well. So he goes and consults and um, he just like has what he calls his Glennon sales diamonds that he shares with his sales classes and, and all the marketing classes. But um, we, we stay in touch and he drops some knowledge bombs on me. And it's just, yeah, like we, we talked this morning uh, about the cyber truck that he just put a down payment on. So uh, oh. that'd be cool if you <laughs> see that rolling around campus, you can uh, catch Professor Glennon in there. Um, but in terms of mentorship, I think that it's just so important to have not just one mentor, but to have a range of mentors because you might get one piece of advice from a 80 year old CEO and get a totally different piece of advice from a 30 year old junior employee who recently joined a company. And both of those could be equally valid. And so having people from different walks of life able to weigh in on the same problems that you are facing, it can just help you make better decisions about what you're trying to do and connect you with people who you might not have normally connected to. So that's one other thing that's great about entrepreneurship is that it opens so many doors. When you reach out to someone and you have a unique business, you're doing an idea that no one's done before, people want to talk to you because they feel like they can have a real impact on your course, but also because you're doing something new, they might have an impact on the world because who knows how far your business can go. Uh, so I think that's one of the benefits of entrepreneurship is that you really get to connect with so many people and you can find those mentors and build that personal advisory board that can stay with you throughout your entire life. Cool, well, thanks for giving back. Yeah. For like students like on the borderline of should I turn this idea into something or should I not? You know, what's what would you say was the deciding factor or what is the deciding factor? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that deciding line is so important. Like that exists for everyone. I mean, Elon Musk was at the deciding line whether to start Tesla or just do something else. And I think it really takes I I forget where. I read this, but it's like, uh, to be a hero, you really only need like five moments of courage in your entire life. It's those, right. it's like a few moments in time that you just do something you weren't normally going to do. And I think starting a business is one of those. It's just like, cause pickles used to be a note in my phone and <laughs> I would take showers, think about it more, write it down. Like you can, plan as much as you want, but it's not going to actually do anything until you start executing those plans. So I think having a rough idea as to what you want to do is good and having a plan, like a direction that you want to head in, but you need to be flexible. And so to, for anyone who thinks of having an idea or they want to get involved, I would say you don't even need to have an idea. You just need to want to do this and if you just had like a passion for 
some people who you wanted to serve, whether it is stray dogs or churches or university students or people who love chicken wings, like whatever it is, you can just get curious about, all right, what, what is it like in your life? What can improve? What problems do you have? And I always recommend, which I didn't do to start off, but starting with customer discovery, just going out there and talking to people, learning about them, because that way you inform much more what business you create because you're actually talking with potential customers. But then those potential customers who just gave you all that feedback, they oftentimes turn into your early adopters because they feel like they help to shape your idea and your business. When you go back to them two, three, four months later with all of that feedback and you say, hey, we just listened to you and we built this prototype. I'd love to get your thoughts on that. And then that's really, I think, the best way of starting a business because it de-risks everything and you're actually building something from the start that you're much more likely to be delivering value to all of those people who you talk to. So yeah, I would say, I would say just start and, and even if you don't have an idea, uh, just like get curious about what problems you see, or even if it's not a problem, how can you imagine the future being better? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. If you don't have any ideas, just follow people like Elon Musk on Twitter and they have tons of ideas. Uh, <laughs> I bet we have a lot of students at CICS that want to be the next Elon Musk, right? They want to be the business and the tech side. Um, and then there's plenty of other students that just love the, the, the potential of new technology, um, but they also want to have an impact with that, those skills that they've learned and that they're continuing to learn. Um, so I'm curious to know, like, you know, obviously you have your tech stack for the website and the app itself, but um, what is it like for those students that are very tech oriented um, to participate in this sort of startup lifestyle or career choice? Yeah. So, I mean, Elon Musk is a freak and I don't know if like, yeah, he, he certainly, um, he's doing incredible things. If you, if you talk to him though, he'll tell you like his personal life is, is a horror show. Like he does not spend time with his family. He has nannies to take care of his kids. Like it's all about what you want and what like you want to kind of get out of life. And yeah, he is certainly taking a difficult route and, but it's, it's incredibly admirable. He's like, he's putting people on the moon. It's, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I do not want to go in that direction. I, I think that having like a, a more holistic approach to things I, I like. And so if you are just like very technical minded, I think it's instead of trying to do everything yourself, finding those people with complementary skill sets in the business school who love finance, who love sales, who love marketing and partner with them to create something because not only will that have people who you can share those ups and downs because there's going to be a ton of ups and downs in any startup. That's what, that's what makes it fun. Uh, that's what also makes it like soul crushing at times, <laughs> but then you also can have people who you're all running in the same direction with. You're not stepping on each other's toes. You can own the tech side of things and you can let someone else own the business side of things. And the two of you can pretty much do everything. If you have the right skills to launch this company, you won't have to outsource. So I would definitely encourage people. I know it's a little bit harder with the virtual world that we live in, but any ways that you can reach into other schools, uh, go to networking events in Eisenberg, go to like, like all, all over campus. That's one thing that I didn't do. I kind of stayed in my little Eisenberg bubble and I didn't walk into Brian's office when I was still a student on campus. It was only when I came back and visited to guest lecture that I actually poked my head in his office. And I really wish that I did that more, but obviously UMass is a massive campus when you're coming from high school. So you want to make it smaller to make it more comfortable. But I think it's just really important to keep pushing those comfort zones and connecting with people who don't take all the same classes as you. Thanks. My impression of a startup and, you know, following your passions is that, uh, you know, it's never too early and it's never too late. 
would you agree and your insights on that? Yeah. I mean, I think it's never too early for you as a founder to start a startup. I do think some technologies are too early for general adoption by the public. Like if, if, I mean, 10 years ago, if someone started talking about NFTs, people would be like, okay, I'm just trying to like wrap my head around blockchain. Like, don't even talk to me about crypto art right now. And there are some companies still like doing crypto art, but now someone sells it for $69 million and everyone is talking about NFTs and they're learning about them. And so I think timing is incredibly important and, and having technology that is, is in vogue in a way like that people, they feel like they can approach and that they can work with like Google glass is another example that was a little bit too early. Like we see all of these wearables coming out now, but they just like tried to do all this stuff before everything had kind of caught up to them. And, uh, and so I think like timing things you, but you certainly never know. And that's why just being in the game and being resilient to be able to stay in it long enough. Cause a lot of people who fail, it's, it's because they just didn't see it through long enough and kind of like stick it out uh, to actually see something to fruition. So I guess just to, to wrap things up here, um, for students who are interested in joining a startup, you know, like Pickles, it's kind of um, making it happen during the pandemic here. Like you said, we used to do events and now there's this need for mental health and there's this need for, you know, um, facilitation of remote events. Um, what's the best approach for them to, to try and get involved or, or to express interest or um, to explore that, that option? Yeah, that's, that is a really great question. Um, I mean, I have gotten my foot in the door at other startups lending free sales and marketing help. And those after a few weeks turned into paid positions. So I think like, especially cause startups, a lot of times they don't have huge budgets. They don't have huge training programs. And so if you can prove your value without being like a huge risk, because it costs a lot to train and onboard a new employee. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you could somehow like express why you're interested in that startup specifically and say like, Hey, saw you're doing this. I'm also passionate about this. And I'd love to see if I can help out like that just opens the door. And then I would say in terms of like reaching out, like LinkedIn can be great uh, and reach out and just show interest and ask questions. I would say that you shouldn't approach that outreach as, Hey, I'm looking for a job, but approach it as, Hey, I'm looking to learn more about your startup to see if this might be a good mutual fit. Like, I just want to hear more about you and your story. And as evidenced here, everyone likes talking about themselves. I haven't been able to shut up during this whole conversation. So <laughs> <Thank> great. <laughs> you Love just it. like show an interest in that startup. They're going to, that just, that just opens the door. And once that door is open, like maybe it's not a good fit that you found out from the quick interview that you did. Uh, so that's great. You don't have to waste your time applying, go and find one that might be a better fit. And yeah, so I think just like starting off and that's the same thing with like customer discovery. If you're starting your own company, it's really about reaching out to people, being interested. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So just show that you care about them, their story, their business, and that you're just trying to learn more, be curious. And I think that will, will open those doors. And, and even if it's not a fit there, then you're in the network then you're in their network. They can connect you with other people. They can keep you in mind as other opportunities might show up. So if I can help as well, you can find me on LinkedIn, Chris Bent. You just search that and uh, send me a message. Let me know how I can help out or what you're working on. And I'd be uh, happy to do so. Awesome. Yeah. You got some diamonds of your own and uh, we're glad that you shared them with <laughs> us today. Um, so check out Pickles, uh, connect with Chris here. Um, and stay tuned for some more startup interviews coming up. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. This Thanks, is fun. Chris. Thank you, Chris.